in lecture today, we're going to build off of the concepts that we started in the last lecture. And really in the last lecture, we only considered reactions where you know, the activation energy for the forward reaction was a lot less than the activation energy for the reverse reaction. And because of that, we called those reactions irreversible. You know, simply that the barrier, the energy barrier to go in the reverse direction was, was practically insurmountable. And it allowed us to write equations, let's say as A plus B goes to C with a one, uh, a one directional arrow. And one of the things that we started to do in the last lecture was to develop rate laws for elementary reactions. So if I could, uh, if somebody could come in here, what would the rate law be for species A for this reaction? Minus K C A C B. Yep, minus K one times C A times C B. Now, rate laws are not always written in terms of concentration. It's something we didn't talk about in the last lecture. We will use this form most of the time, but it's also possible for a gas phase reaction that you could write the rate law for the elementary reaction as minus K1 times the pressure of A times the pressure of B. And of course, the units for those two, um, well, maybe that's the wrong arrow to point here. The units for those two rate constants will be different. Right, because one will be in terms of concentration, one will be in terms of pressure. But you could do either one of those things. However, there are reactions where the activation energy for the forward reaction is similar to the activation energy for the reverse reaction. And actually another way of saying this is also that the absolute value of delta G is not huge. Right, those, those two statements end up being equivalent to each other. And if that's the case, we can write the reaction a little bit differently. We can say, well, A plus B actually is in equilibrium with C. And we have some reaction rate constant K1 and some reverse reaction rate constant as K minus one. And so if we were to start to develop a reversible rate law like this, right? We would begin exactly where we did above, where we would say that that's minus K1 times CA times CB, right? Because we're consuming A. But then you form A through the reverse process. So that becomes plus K minus one times the concentration of C. And you could write this for, um, a pressure-based reaction as well, right? Minus K1 times PA times PB plus K minus one times PC. So we have typically a measurement of let's say K1. And if we have K1 and a little bit more thermodynamic information, we also know what K minus one is because in thermo two, you guys derived a relationship for these. And that is that, that K is equal to K one over K minus one. And now how you would find K is dependent on whether we are talking about a pressure-based reaction or a concentration-based rate law, right? Really not the reaction. And that's because in thermo two, you guys developed an extensive tool set to calculate these values and to use them to find equilibrium compositions. That's a huge part of that class. And you'll remember that delta G equals minus RT ln K, right? But in thermo, you guys dealt exclusively almost with uh, gas phase reactions. And when you were talking about fugacity and the fugacity coefficient, that meant that you talked a lot about pressure. And it turns out that this, re that this equation, delta G equals minus RT ln K, that K is actually something that we call K sub P, which is 
the um, which is a pressure based equilibrium constant, right? And so you were calculating that value kp from the exponent of minus delta g over rt, right? And you also were told that that was equal to the product over all the species, right? Of the activity of all the species. Now, the activity in the gas phase is just represented by the fugacity. And maybe my script F can be a little bit better, right? So that's the fugacity of I over all of those species, which of course is just the product of the mole fraction of each species times the fugacity coefficient times the pressure, right? So in this example that we have above where A plus B is in equilibrium with C, that means that Kp is equal to the mole fraction of C times the fugacity coefficient of C times the pressure divided by Ya phi A times P times Yb phi B times P, right? And so then if we're going to assume, at least for this short derivation, that we have an ideal gas, then all the fugacity coefficients are equal to one. And we know that the behavior of the gas phase is bound by PV equals NRT. So if we multiply both sides by the mole fraction of any of the species, we actually come up with a relationship that Yi times P times V is equal to Ni RT. And that means Yi times P is equal to Ni over V times RT. And Ni over V is just the concentration. And so we could say that that's equal to RT times the concentration of species I. And this gives us a way to go back and forth in our problem solving between pressure and concentration. And so if we look at this then, Kp, this thing that we derived, is equal to just the product over I of the result of all of these activities. So that's the product of RT times the concentration of I, right? And this is equivalent to this, right? From our derivation here. And one of the things then that we can say is that Kp equals RT times this thing that I'll call delta Ng, and I'll talk about that in a second, times the product of the concentrations of I. And this Ng, delta Ng, is simply the change in the number of moles in the gas phase in the reaction. So like where A plus B goes to C, delta Ng is equal to minus one, for example, okay? And now why are we actually doing this? Well, it's because if we divide then by this RT to the delta Ng, that is gonna be equal to this thing that we call Kc, which is the product of all the concentrations. And what that lets us do is write equivalent rate laws with pressure and concentration where we can either calculate Kp or Kc depending on which one the problem calls for. And of course, when, um, when delta Ng is equal to zero, then RT to that is equal to one. 
So then KP just equals KC, okay? And we won't do a lot of interchange between these two, but you should know that you may have to do this occasionally. And so these rate laws or the equivalent rate laws would be that RA is minus K1 times CA CB plus K1 over KC times the concentration of C or that RA equals minus K1 PA PB plus K1 over KP times the pressure of C, okay? And those two are equivalent. And if you were to solve problems with either one of those, you would get the identical solution, okay? So one of the things that I would like for us to do today is to solve a couple of examples now where the activation energy for the forward and the reverse reaction are similar. And so now we have to consider the reversibility of the reaction, okay? Before I do that, does anybody have questions about this? The first example that we'll solve today, I know is a little wordy, but, but we'll make some sense out of it. So it says your company makes two propanol that is used to make five weight percent solutions with deionized water to, that's used as a disinfectant for medical applications. However, during storage, two propanol can undergo a reversible isomerization to form one propanol, which has a higher explosion hazard rating. The safety limit in your storage tanks for the ratio of one propanol to two propanol is five to one. So what is the longest time that the mixed product can be stored. So the mixed product, of course, is the 5% solution before it must be bottled, assuming that the storage temperature is 25 degrees C. And below that, you're given a little bit of additional information. You're given, um, you're given K1. You are given the volume of a tank and you're given the Gibbs free energy of formation for both two propanol and for one propanol, okay? So to solve this problem, I think the first and maybe most logical thing to do is to see if theoretically we ever reach the safety limit, right? Do we ever get to this ratio of five to one? And we know if we were to say, um, write our rate law that we have A is in equilibrium with B, right? Where A is two propanol and we'll say B is one propanol. And I like to use A and B and C and D and that stuff whenever I can, instead of having these long names attached to um, reactants and products. So if we were to write the rate law here, right? So the rate of A is of course equal to, and if we say this is K1 and that's K minus one, that this is just K1 times CA or minus K1 times CA plus K minus one times the concentration of B. And of course we said just a minute ago that we can relate K1 or K minus one to K1 and KC. So we know that this is minus K1 times CA plus K1 over KC times the concentration of B. And another way to get to the relationship that we had before where we had that the equilibrium um, constant was equal to um, the product of our, um, uh, the product of K1 and K2 is actually to just assume that the rate here is equal to zero. But anyway, we know that KC is equal to the product of the concentration of both of those, of, of those species, right? We did that just a second ago. And so that is just CB over um, CA, right? And that's raised to the stoichiometric coefficient. So that's CB over CA. And so now what we have to do here is calculate the value for K and know, will these concentrations ever be greater 
than five to one, right? That's the thing that we really need to figure out. So to find KC, well, we know here that um, it doesn't matter whether we, or how we necessarily calculate K because for a problem like this, KP is equal to KC because Delta NG is equal to zero, right? So we can just directly use the Gibbs energy of formation that we have for these two species. And we know that um, KC then is equal to the exponent of minus Delta G over RT. And so that's the exponent of minus, and then the Gibbs energy of formation for a one propanol on the, uh, on the problem statement is 162,440 joules per mole minus 151,180 joules per mole, then divided by R, which is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times the temperature. And we said in the problem it was gonna be stored at 25 degrees C. So that's 298.15 Kelvin, right? And we know from here that the units will cancel, right? That's joules per mole will cancel and Kelvin will cancel. And that's a good thing because in the exponential, um, there should not be any units, all right? And from here, we can calculate Kc. So uh, Kc then is equal to 93.92, okay? So first of all, um, we know for a fact that we will reach at some point during storage, the explosion limit or, or the safety limit. It won't necessarily explode, but, but we'll reach the safety limit, right? Because the ratio of CA to CB at some point will be greater than five to one. So the question here then is how long will that take, right? And that, that's a perfect question for a class like kinetics because Everything that we've done so far is just thermo. And remember, thermo tells you where you would get in an infinite time whenever you reached equilibrium. But we are interested in a more practical question of, okay, well, we're gonna store these things, how long until we break the rules? And so now we can figure that out because we have, um, we have our rate loss for these two processes and our, our balances. So remember for a batch reactor, Our mole balance simplified to DNI DT is equal to RI times V. And that's always true. Now, later we could get into semi batch reactors where there's flow in at the same time and everything, and that'll be a different story. But here, we just have a batch reactor, and that mole balance will hold. And so we know then that DNA DT is equal to Ra times V and DNB DT is equal to Rb times V. And so we have DNA DT equals, and we already have the rate law for A, we wrote it above, right? That's minus K1 times CA plus K1 over KC times CB. And now D and B D T, and that's times the volume. And remember that the uh, rate of A over its stoichiometric coefficient is equal to the rate of B over its stoichiometric coefficient. And so that means that R A over minus one equals R B over one, or R B equals minus R A. And so we can use that here and minus RA is just K1 times CA minus K1 over KC times CB times the volume. Now for both of these, we can assume that the volume is constant. And that's not too bad because the two reactants that we have here are, well, first of all, in an aqueous solution, right? We have a 5% solution. Uh, we also have, uh, they're also liquids that are isomers. So their density is not gonna be really, really different. So we could say that this constant volume assumption works well. And if we do that, that means that we can just divide both sides by volume and have these final forms of our rate of our, our mass balances to solve, right? Minus K1 times CA 
plus K1 over KC times CB. And DCB, DT, is equal to K1 times CA minus K1 over KC times CB. Okay, and those are our two equations that we're going to have to solve. Now, before we do that, uh, does anybody have any questions about what we did to get here? I had a question about when you calculated KC um, and you did the Gibbs free energy. Did you mm -hmm. calculate the Gibbs free energy so that you didn't have to make it negative? Because when I did your Gibbs free energy and then plugged it in, but made it negative, um, I got KC was like below one. Yeah, what do you mean, but made it negative? So in the exponent, it has like negative 162,000, blah, 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 over um, RT. And when I plug it in the way you have it written, I get 0 0.01. But when I plug it in with no negative, I get the number that you got. Yeah, let me look at this for just a second. Here, let me look at it later. I don't want to, I won't take up time, but we'll just use that value for now. I know those two numbers are the, are okay, but maybe I just flip the one propanol and two propanol, which is okay. possible. Yeah, that's a good question. I'll look at that later. Thank good you. question. Yeah, good question. All right, anybody else? Okay, kind of basic question. For the, the um, differential for the moles, um, the D and I, DT, um, what's the RI? Is that rate? Yes, that is the rate law, right? That is. You just passed it. This thing that oh. we wrote. Yep. Okay. Yep. And that's something that you'll see. That's like the first step almost every time we get to solving a problem is what is the rate law? So we'll figure out based on the reactor what mole balance we have to use. And then from there, we'll figure out what the rate law is. That's usually the first thing that we'll do. All right, good question. All right, so there's two issues here. I think the first one is that we don't have an initial condition yet. Uh, we kind of do. We know it's a five weight percent solution, but um, we need to get that in terms of concentration. The second thing is that we have a pair of coupled ordinary differential equations. So we're going to have to do something. Um, we're going to have to do something to solve that. And so the first thing we're going to do is find what the initial concentrations are. The second thing that we're going to do is um, use Euler's method to solve the problem. And in lecture two, there are a little bit of details about using Euler's method. But this is something that is going to take a little while for you guys to get used to. I might do something very brief about it here and, and maybe show you the Excel file that I used. But understanding how it works and implementing it is going to take a little bit of time. So it's also why I emailed you guys the lecture to Excel file that I used. So that way, when we have this sort of like food network magic that happens, right? Like then we use oils, Euler's method and you pull the turkey out of the oven. Um, you guys at least were able once to see what's sort of under the hood, right? So that's too many. Um, that's too many like convoluted analogies or whatever, but hopefully you guys get what I'm saying. So all right, let's first things first, let's find the initial concentrations. Well, at time equal to zero, we're gonna say that CB is equal to zero, right? Because that is the product of the isomerization that happens after we made 100% pure 2-propanol and then mixed it, okay? So at T equal to zero, CB equals zero. So now we have to figure out um, the concentration in moles per liter of 2-propanol. Of Right? So we know it's a five weight percent solution. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to assume a basis that it's 100 grams uh, or the, a, a basis of 100 grams and say then that CA0 equals the mass, the initial mass of 2-propanol divided by the initial volume. And the volume is going to be comprised of both 2-propanol and water. So here I have... Um, we're gonna say it's the mass of 2-propanol divided by the molecular weight of 2-propanol, right? That'll give us moles divided by the mass of 2-propanol over the density of 2-propanol plus the mass of water divided by the density of water, 
Okay. And mass over density should give us volume and mass over molecular weight should give us moles. So if I do this, this is five grams of two propanol divided by the molecular weight of two propanol, which is 60.09 grams per mole divided by, remember I had a hundred gram basis. So this is five grams over 785 grams per liter plus water, which is 95 grams over 997 grams per liter. And so I can find that the initial concentration of A is 0.819 molar, okay? So now we have CB0 and CA0. And now we can go about solving this problem. And now the way that Euler's method works is that you're used to in calculus getting to these places where you're interested in slopes, right? And you say like the change in X over the change in Y. And then what they tell you is that, you know, as Delta X goes to zero, you can make this a derivative, right? DX DY. Well, Euler's method is trying to get us to do the opposite. So we know that we have this differential and I'm just gonna use CA as an example. So we have this equation DCA DT is equal to minus K1 times CA plus K1 over KC times CB. And what we're gonna do is actually change these to deltas and say that we can use the time or the conditions right now to predict what's gonna happen at some time delta T in the future. So delta CA over delta T is equal to minus K1 times CA plus K1 over KC times CB. And I'm just gonna multiply both sides by delta T. So that's just delta T times minus K1 CA plus K1 over KC times CB. And this is CA at T plus delta T minus CA at time T or right now equals delta T. Oh, sorry, we already have the equals. This is the concentration of A right now. And this is the concentration of B right now. So all we're gonna do is let's say at, an, at the initial condition, okay? We can calculate that CA at delta T, right? Because at this would be T equals zero plus delta T. That equals then CA zero, right? From this plus delta T times minus K1 times CA zero plus K1 over KC times CB zero. And we'll call this maybe CA one. And we do this both for CA and for CB. And I know this might be a little confusing, but you guys will get practice with it. And I'll, like I said, I'll show you the Excel in a second. So now we have CA at Delta T, whatever we chose. Now we have to be somewhat careful because if you choose too big of a Delta T, it'll, it'll calculate a Delta CA that's way too big and you'll get these nonsense answers. So we do have to be somewhat careful and that's what the homework problem is trying to show you. And then we do this again. So CA2, right, which is at two Delta T, right, is then equal to CA1 plus Delta T times minus K1 CA1 plus K1 over KC times CB1. And you do this over and over and over and over again. And I'll show you that for this particular problem. And like I said, it's gonna take a little bit of practice. So what you'll see here is that I have all of the knowns here in, um, I have all of the knowns here in the Excel file. 
right? So I have the Gibbs free energy, which I actually think looking at this, I just flipped them. So I apologize for that. Um, and then I have, or maybe I flipped them here. Anyway, whatever, we'll deal with that later. Right now we're doing Euler's method. So right now I have delta T, right, is equal to 0.3 hours. And I have time increasing by delta T each time, sorry. And now here's where I implement Euler's method. So obviously I just have the initial conditions for CA and CB. And then what I do is CA at, let's see if I can show the highlights here. So here the concentration of A in the second, um, in the second row here, or row, I guess it's row nine in the Excel file, is A5, which is delta T times minus K1 times CA at the time before it, right? That's what B8 is, plus K1 over K times the concentration for B, the previous one, which is C8 plus the concentration of A above it. So if you don't see it right now, hopefully you guys can go back and, and watch this and, and, and see that that's the case, that that's just the rate law implemented in, um, that's just the rate law implemented. I don't know what's going on here. There we go, in Excel. No, I don't wanna write. All right, let's do that. All right, and then for B, I did the same thing. It's just delta T, if you look in the function line above, that's just delta T times K1 times CA minus K1 over K times CB plus the initial concentration of B. And I, once I have those two formulas, I can just drag those formulas down to the bottom of our file. And I can also calculate the concentration of CB and CA and, um, and come up with a solution to this problem. So, sorry, we're gonna do the whole food network thing, ta-da, and there it is. So there's the concentration of A and B or one propanol and two propanol as a function of time as given by um, Euler's method. And it turns out that the solution is really, really different than if you didn't consider the equilibrium reaction, if you just thought that it went in one direction. And maybe that's not best shown here, but it's best shown here in the ratio because we're asked in the problem for how much time it takes until the ratio of one to two propanol is five to one. And so you can see here, I drew a horizontal red line here where it's equal to five to one. And not considering or considering our reverse reaction, that ends up being about 67 days, right? 1600 hours. And not considering the reverse reaction is about 56 days or 1350 hours. And so you could, if you didn't consider the equilibrium, you actually could um, underestimate the number of days that you could safely store this. Now, whether that matters in the grand scheme of things, who knows, depends on the overall process. But in the context of our problem here, actually considering equilibrium was, was important. Now, at the very beginning, let's say, um, you know, the first 500 hours or so, maybe not, maybe it doesn't matter at all. But certainly as you went to answer the question, considering the equilibrium was important, okay? So hopefully in this first example, you guys have a little bit of a feeling for, you know, how do we write rate laws for these reversible reactions? And then um, the beginning of us implementing Euler's method, which is gonna take a little bit of time for everybody to get comfortable with, okay? All right. So. Now what I'd like to do is to start our second example. And our second example today says that you're in charge of a rigid or constant volume batch reactor operating at 280 degrees C that's being fed by a stream from another reactor with the following composition. So you have this mole fraction of A, B, C, D, and E. The purpose of your reactor is to maximize the amount of C that is formed in the reactor by promoting that reaction to happen. So first we ask, what is the maximum possible conversion? And second, we are asked to predict the product profiles 
as, as a function of time, okay? So the first thing that I know that we're going to have to do here is we're gonna to have to find what the equilibrium constant is here, okay? And so our equilibrium constant is K is equal to the exponent of minus, and this is KP, minus delta G divided by RT. Now we're given delta G in this problem, right? It's minus 8550 joules per mole divided by, again, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, then multiplied by the temperature, which is 280 degrees C. So that's 280 plus 273.15 Kelvin, okay? And from there, we can find Kp, which is equal to 6.4 two. Okay. So now we have our equilibrium coefficient and we know that the stoichiometry is one to one. So we can solve this problem either in terms of pressure or in terms of concentration. Now, if you look at this, we don't have K1. This is the first problem where we don't directly have this. Instead, we have K0 and we have the temperature. So remember from our previous lecture that K1 is K0 times the exponent of minus the activation energy divided by RT. So we are provided the activation energy and we're provided this pre-exponential factor. And so we can calculate this. So K1 is equal to K0, which is 0 0.025 liters per mole times seconds times the exponent of minus 15,000 joules per mole divided by 8.314, again, times our temperature, which is 553.15 Kelvin, right? Which is 280 degrees C. Sorry, that's a little crammed. I'll try better not to, not to do that. And from there, we can calculate K1. So that's 9.58 times 10 to the minus four liters per mole times seconds. Now, one interesting thing here is how do we know whether we should solve this problem in terms of pressure or concentration, right? Because we know that those two are the same. Well, it turns out the answer is actually in the units of of the rate constant that we have. So liter per mole is in terms of concentration. So I would solve this in terms of the concentrations. And if we're gonna do that, we have to find out what those are. So remember, if we're gonna assume that we have these gas phase reactions and they're bound by the ideal gas law that we can multiply both sides by, uh, our mole fraction and find that yi times p is equal to ni over v times rt or the concentration here, right? ni over v is equal to p divided by rt or, um, Let me look at this really quick over P, which is YIP, right, over RT. There we go. And if we do that, let's look at CA0, right? So we know that that 0 0.1 times 20 bar divided by 0 0.08314 liter bar per mole Kelvin times 553.15 Kelvin. And CA0 is in 0 0.043 moles per liter. And we can do the exact same calculation for all of the other ones, right? So CB0 is just 0 0.5 times the pressure over RT. And so that's 
0 0.440. CC0 is equal to 0 0.264. CA0 is 0 0.018, or sorry, CD0. And the concentration of E at the beginning is 0 0.070, right? And those are all moles per liter. Okay. All right. So now we have the initial concentration for all of those species. And we can use that to predict their product profiles as a function of time. And we're still in a batch reactor. We're told it's rigid and it's a gas phase. And so that's like thermo speak almost for constant volume, right? That's how we would sneak constant volume in thermo classes. Um, and we know then when we have our batch reactor that DNA DT is equal to, or maybe a little bit more general at first, right? DNI DT is equal to RI times V. And if the volume's constant, that means that DCI DT is equal to the rate law, right? Is equal to RI. And so let's do that for all of these species. And we can find that DCA DT is equal to minus K1 times CACB, right? Because our reaction, if you look to the right, is A plus B is in equilibrium with C plus D. So minus K1 CACB plus K1 over K C of CC times CD. DCB DT is equal to the same thing, right? Because the stoichiometric coefficient for A and B is minus one. So that's K1 CACB plus K1 over KC times CC times CD. DCC DT is equal to K1 CACB minus K1 over KC times CCCD. DCD DT is equal to K1 CACB minus K1 over KC, CCCD. And DCE DT is equal to zero, right? Because it doesn't participate in the reaction at all. All right. So what can we do here? Well, we can do the same thing that we have, um, that we did in the previous example, that we can use Euler's method to solve this problem where you change the Ds to deltas, you pick a delta and solve the problem in Excel. And that's exactly what I did. And you can see that result here on the right-hand side where um, it's the concentration of each one of those species. And I'm sorry, it's a little small. So let me make it a little bit bigger. Here, I'll do this. Where you see the concentration of A, B, C, D, and E as a function of time. So of course, E doesn't change. And um, A goes to zero. Um, we should have expected from the initial concentration that that would be a limiting reactant. And then B goes down a little bit, C and D go up a little bit. And, um, and you can see the conversion here of A on the right-hand side, which was just the moles of A reacted over the moles of A fed, which we did um, in lecture the, in the, the last time, okay? So the last thing, right, in, in the last minute or so that we have of class, um, I want us to just think a little bit about how could we further shift the conversion. So this thing took, you know, let's say about 150 minutes to reach the equilibrium conversion. And that's, first of all, something to think about when you have an equilibrium reaction, the conversion can't equal one, right? You can never get there. You have some maximum theoretical conversion uh, that's based on the, that's based on the, on the rate constant, right? So if you just put it in a batch reactor and do that, um, you can't reach you can't reach a hundred percent conversion. All right, but what are some ways that we could get to the conversion in a in a in a lower amount of time? What do you guys think?
that we could do. Maybe like increasing the temperature? Yep. Yeah, uh, certainly you can change the temperature. Now, whether you would increase it or decrease it actually depends on which, um, on if the reaction is um, spontaneous or not. So if delta G were negative, you would increase the temperature. If delta G were positive, you would decrease the temperature, right? Because then you're just changing the ratio between K1 and K2, right? And you're trying to um, make the ratio of K1 to K2 bigger. So yeah, if if it's already spontaneous and you're getting to big conversions, absolutely increase the temperature. It'll get there, it'll certainly do that. Um, what about, uh, what else? Let's see what else you guys might think of. I think temperature was good. Anything else that you guys can think of? There's kind I mean, of already a lot of things in this equation, but um, I mean, you could always catalyze it to up the conversion rate. Yeah, I mean, you could uh, change the rate constant, right? Which a catalyst is one way to do that. Also changing the temperature was a way to do that as well. So that's not bad. If you needed a catalyst, you could do that. So let's say that this is just homogeneous in solution, right? Um, so not catalyzed yet. I mean, another thing we could do if you look at the rate law here is, you know, how do we make this bigger than that, right? So one, we talked about, you know, changing this ratio and changing the value of that specifically. The other thing that you could do is increase concentration. So you could always feed even more B, even though A is already a limiting reactant, and that could also help with the conversion of A. That's a good one. Um, the other thing I want to to maybe talk to you guys about is a little bit um, uh, is a little bit unusual, maybe something you've never thought about before. And it's not always done necessarily when you have one thing that's such a limiting reactant, but when you have, <clears throat> excuse me, when you have an equilibrium that you're trying to break. And one of the things that you could do is think about other ways to shift the equilibrium further in this direction, right? So one way is, you know, manipulate the temperature. One is manipulate the concentration of the reactants. The other one though, is to manipulate the concentration of the products. And you think about, well, how might I do that? Well, one way is, let's say that we introduced a membrane that was um, perm selective to C, right? So C is the thing that we want. And let's say in like pervaporation, for example, in a pervaporation reactor, it's usually like ethanol that you're looking to extract through a membrane that's on the outside of this, of, on the outside of the reactor. So if we introduced a membrane, um, that was only perm selective to C, we could, right? We have this rigid vessel, so the volume's still constant. So all the equations we derived are fine, except now we're gonna remove C at some rate. And let's say that the mass transfer rate here, so we're gonna say K star was equal to 0 0.01 moles per minute, okay? Well, what would that do? to the equilibration time, right? Well, it, it decreased it actually. So here, you know, we don't get to steady state really until 150 to 200 minutes. And here, not only, you know, forget the time it took to get to equilibrium because you never get there because you're always taking C out. But what did it let us do? It let us get to 100% conversion, which was more important. Right, so here, after 150 to 200 minutes, we hit equilibrium at uh, a value that's around 0 0.8, which we could have predicted at the beginning just from um, the stuff that you guys did in Thermo 2. But now we're able to break the equilibrium because if you keep removing C continuously, you can keep reacting A on the other side, okay? So, you know, today, hopefully, 
you guys saw a couple of good examples on you know how we do calculations for reversible reactions how we can uh, implement Euler's method to help us solve these complicated problems and uh, at least one example where we thought of how do we break or how do we shift the equilibrium and then how do we break the equilibrium 